people deluded, I'm back yeah. again. Come on, Ian. Come on. <laughs> As the big man Ian Wright said, there people deluded, I'm back again. We've just finished a live stream on Jesse's channel. Make sure you're checking out She Knows Arsenal. But we're here again. How are you doing? How's the international break treated you? Oh, I enjoyed my break from Arsenal. I was celebrating. I it was like, the same thing. You. International break. You came at just the right time. Um, and I feel like I might be mentally stable enough to go back in. So, yeah, let's let's see how it goes. <laughs> let's start there, yeah. Do you think we can win the league? Do you think the league's gone? Listen, call me Leanne Gunner if you want to. I don't give a shit. Y'all, I told y'all when the, when the transfer window closed, I said we have a very small chance of winning that Premier League. And then after a couple of the points we dropped, I was like, it's done. You just can't be dropping the points the way that we are. We're nine points off the pace now from Liverpool. And yes, there's this idea that they're just going to fall away magically. Um, but, you know, nine points is a big gap at this stage. Um, so Only 11 games, though. Do you, do you think you're giving up <laughs> prematurely? Mm. 27 more games to play. Well, well I'll, I'll put it this way. That I think the best team almost always wins the league. Leicester was an anomaly. Like it was a once in a lifetime type of situation where the best team didn't really win it, but it was like magical for them. Most of the time, the best team over a 38 game period will win. You don't get luck in the Premier League. Everything evens itself out. All the unlucky moments and the lucky moments even themselves out. And over a 38 game period, you will see who's the best team. Do I think we're the best team? No, I don't. And so, yeah. For periods, we can look like the best team. Like last season, there were periods where we did, but over the 38 game period, we were not. So, and we're, we feel worse now. So maybe it is giving up prematurely, but I just, I don't, what, I mean, what do you think? You, you Do you think we could still win it? Boy, I, I, that, so like you, I was called the, the, you know, the man of doom and gloom and believing it's all done and things like that. I could only comment on what I see. Of course, there's 27 games. The narrative can change. It's down to the players and, and the gaffer to change that. And I hope it is the case. But from what I'm seeing, I can't see light at the end of the tunnel. I think we've engineered our own issues and it's another season where we shot ourselves in the foot. I do think there are valid claims in that, you know, we've had a tough start to the season, et cetera, et cetera. The next 10, 11 games could look different. But at the same time, I always say to people, I hear that you're not wrong what we played Spurs away Villa away City away played Liverpool uh you know Newcastle away we've had some tough games but I always say to people everyone's got to play each other twice and every fan base probably has that calendar of fixtures where they're like oh this is where it goes left kind of thing if I'm honest so that's where I'm at it's, it's more hopeful but we can't sit here and lie we're further in the three horse race there it's like my logic is telling me it's done it's more one percent faith and you hope the footballing gods can allow us so how do we salvage the season then Jess? If the league's gone, we're still in the champs, still in the League Cup, still in the FA Cup. Beyond the obvious, what's the best case scenario then? I think you turned it. I think you muted your mic, you know. I sure did. Um, <laughs> I do that all the time. Um, Mikel has to win a trophy. Like, it's just, and I know it's like, how could you, you know, probably, you have to, yeah, he must. He must. Why? This season, last season, I let him off the hook. I was like, yeah, but, you know, we started off slow and then we kind of caught up and we're playing some of the best football we've ever played under Mikel Arteta at the end of the season. I'm lucky. We added new players in. Blah, blah, blah. This season? Nah. You, you have to stop the bleeding at some point. And my biggest concern about this group is that they don't know how to win and they're becoming really good losers. And that's... don't Nearly like, men. Yeah, they're nearly men. A lot men. of foreplay, no penetration. Yeah, they're... We're such a good side, and there's nothing about this team that makes me think that they cannot win a trophy. Does that mean that they can? They're going to win the prem? No. But do I think that they could win a, a Karabuki or a FA Cup? Yeah, hell yeah. We we could we won that shit when we were awful. You know, I went back and I watched that final between us and Chelsea. We were trash. We were awful. So you don't have to be the best team to win a cup. You have to be the best team to win the Premier League. It's different. So I think just stopping the bleeding, you know, rehabilitating the season, making sure that you finish in that top four, Mikel. Don't get stupid. Finish in that top four. Yeah, okay. That's what that should be a sackable offense at the very yeah, minimum. You, the you, you must. You must finish in that top four, salvage the season, 
get us back up the table a little bit more, get us consistent. And then don't put, you don't have to put all your eggs in that basket, but take those domestic cups seriously. I was around United fans when they won that stankin' ass Carabao Cup. They were. They rewrite history, man. They were so happy. And I was like, yeah, I mean, second is fine. You know, second is fine. At the end of the season, second is fine. We're on the right track. You need to start winning trophies. It'll, it'll, it won't change the whole narrative around the club because I've heard people say, like, well, what is the Carabao Cup and the FA Cup going to do to the narrative around the club? It's not about the narrative around the club. Until we win the Premier League or a Champions League, the narrative will not change. In fact, even when we do that, it still probably won't change because it was so long that we've done anything major. The The whole thing about winning a trophy now is to get these players into a winning mindset to understand how to win. Um, and I think that'll help them out. So, yeah, um, I think just a trophy would would really help to salvage the season. I think in terms of the Champions League, finishing that top eight, um, we've made it difficult on ourselves in that competition as well. But finishing that top eight, try not to have those additional games and go as far as you can. We went to the quarterfinals last season. Let's try to get to the semifinals, you know. Um, to me, that's progress in a competition where most of our players last season had never played in it before. You know, we had like one or two players that had played in it before. So I think that's kind of where I'm at. You know, what about, like, what do you, what, what, if Arteta doesn't, I don't want to do the, do you sack him if he doesn't, you know, but do you feel, no, I think let's, let's, let's do that. Like, let's do that. Let's, okay. let's, 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 let's do that. Like, where, where do, where do you stand if he doesn't do that? Doesn't win a trophy? Like, where do you stand? I mean, I've never felt like the conversation. If he wins a league or an FA Cup, League Cup or FA Cup, is, it, this is the very things Wenger was killed for, really. Yeah, I mean, it, but it all de- to me, it all depends on the league because Arson was finishing, scraping fourth and getting a FA Cup every once in a while. If we're still, if we can close the gap on on Liverpool and at least be within a couple of points and be like remotely around it, I feel like that's the difference in the context. I feel like the context around Wenger was, yeah, a couple of FA Cups, but we were never in a title race. We weren't. We were getting fourth this season. You know, maybe we are trying to get fourth, but if we can close that gap, get second, the city are horrendous right now. We don't know. We haven't been able to take advantage of that. Yeah. So if we can at least close the gap on Liverpool and be in the title race and, you know, that's different. The context is different, but if he doesn't, I don't think the conversation around a managerial change should be so taboo. I don't know why the the fan base feels like the the discourse. I've already drawn up their battle lines, man. Yeah, to me, it, it shouldn't be. We should be able to have these conversations and it not feel like a attack on your who you are as a person. Like, because that's what it feels like. People are like, how dare you even, do you know where we where were before, Mikel? And I'm like, I get it. Which is great. One love for the rebuild. It's just about getting over the line now. Yeah, exactly. Our life. It's genuinely that. We, are you a winner? That's where we are. We're at the, can he be the guy that wins Champions League, Premier League? Or you know, are you Brendan Rodgers? Yeah, are you Brendan Rogers? Not even in a disingenuous way. Are you just a guy to set everything up for the next one to fly? Looking at Barcelona with Xavi and Hansi Flick. I was just about to make that example because I feel like people don't want to think about that maybe being a a reality because they bet their horse on this group and this manager to make it to the end. And I don't know after five, six years under this manager with the lack of trophies that you can justify not having the conversation. I just don't think so. So am I willing to wait for Arteta to mature into a world-class manager to get to where we want to go? I don't know because, you know, I'm not trying to lose our better players. I'm already, it's just Saliba's leaving for Real Madrid. That's just, you know, so. Two years left on his deal in the summer. Yeah. As like with Saka and a couple of us at this Mm -hmm. moment in time. So that's kind of where I'm at with it. Now, all the who would replace him, you know, all that kind of stuff. The Barcelona fans, you know, were not who's going to replace Xavi. They got Hansi Flick and they improved. And Hansi Flick, his stocks were fucking low when they hired him. Everybody had, oh, he sure. failed, you know, at Bayern Munich, he wasn't, ah, da, la, la. And now look, I do think we're disingenuous about the coaching talent that's out there. And sometimes you just need a different voice. Take the women. 
the women true, true, true. Very good point. and it was stale it was rank they were not happy they were not playing with joy and just with the interim manager it's like a breath of fresh air so i think it's something that we sh we could be a little bit more open to talking about at least as fans um at the end of the season if he doesn't win any trophies if people are still acting like you know there's just no other avenue but Mikel after this then i just feel like they're just being so disingenuous you know but um will i be out there saying sack him i don't know i don't know if i have it in me i might just hibernate for the summer and see what happens <laughs> You know, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a it's a it's a it's a difficult one, Jess, man. Because on one hand, I do think Mikel Arteta, maybe not so much now because we're not winning, but you're a very good coach. You're a bit of a genius in that regard. The many thing you've done for the rebuild, where you've got Arsenal to, you, you're great. The issue is kind of what you alluded to. I don't want to wait for you to be great. I mean, we already are. I care about my football team. I don't want you to be here, kind of have a free ride, and then we don't succeed. You go elsewhere because there is also that avenue where. He gets obviously frustrated, but at the same time, you've been given a lot of money. You're the manager. You've been allowed to make unpopular decisions, which other people at the club haven't necessarily agreed with. And a lot of it has been backed up. But as I said, in line of the rebuild, if the club just want to get top four, that stuff is great. In terms of being a winner, Mikel Arteta, you were surrounded at City with winners. You know as, what, it, what it takes. But are you a winner in your own, own bracket? And I think you touched on something great where you basically said like, it shouldn't be taboo. Reality is we don't know if keeping... There was times where Arteta could have and should have been sat back-to-back -back eight. In hindsight, that was the best thing to do. We could keep the guy and we go on to bigger and better days and me and you look back at this live stream and say, oh, what was we talking about? Likewise, we could get a lot worse. Sacking or keeping the manager doesn't guarantee success, but at this same time, what else are you supposed to do? There's other clubs, you know, you've got Pep Guardiola and, and Klopp who were at their clubs for a while. I know Chelsea's a bit of a mad environment but when Chelsea were Chelsea like the big guys they it's, it's known the manager didn't have too long there Real Madrid the same so there isn't one singular path do you feel the club feel the same way like us though because they gave him a new deal before the ball was kicked this year no I don't I think the Cronkies are very much so um in love with Mikel I think Mikel is the project um and to me that's the problem I feel like Amen. Yes, Arteta should get time. He should get the resources. He should be able to build a squad in his image. But he's done that now. And now we're kind of doing the merry-go-round. And I just feel like there has to be some sort of, okay, so what are you going to deliver? And Arteta can talk, he could probably talk, he could talk anybody down. You know, it's it's Pep, you know, it's hard to beat City. But once Pep goes, then, you know, we'll be, if Liverpool win this title, do you understand how crazy we're going to look? You know? Oh, it's not. Yeah, people can sit there to age your point. People can sit there and say they got Van Dyke, they got this, they got that, which is all true. They've got experienced players, but he's gone in and just worked a bit of magic. Now, we can't draw too many conclusions on Liverpool, but they're flying at the moment. So this whole needing time thing, I do think it makes sense. But as you kind of yeah. said, how far does it go? Yeah. How, how far do we trust it where we're like, okay, we should be winning now? You know, and I wish I was privy to the i'm not really getting in finals either are we yeah we're not i want to see that whatever the fucking roadmap that they were talking about that they had that said what the process was going to be i want to see what that is because i need and to see if you guys were waiting 10 years like i thought it was like four years and it's looking like you guys are really like patient with it and like you said it would be totally different if we were reaching finals if we were you know improving in every single dimension right now we just challenge city for first losers seasons. for and that's it no finals no other trophies no nothing you know so we have to expect more of this club because really where we're trying to get to is champions league and premier leagues and also winning multiple trophies a season that's where we're trying to get to we're really far away from that Facts. and yeah and so yeah our they, dog is called win what are we doing like everything's yeah. <laughs> geared up towards that you hear our like tech, our bodyguard, the conky they talk about winning Jess. winning is trophies obviously winning we can do all of that self-help book stuff about winning is how you conduct and carry yourself which is all true but winning i'm sure the okay. players and Mikel arteta want to win major honors i can caveat that with Arteta is going the wrong way about it I honestly think the club are complacent now we look at the Cronkies I do think you've got to approach this Arsenal situation at many layers I think whether you think the Cronkies should be proven winners or behave like Abramovich and that 
great. But they've shown they get people in place, they leave you to your own devices. So you could ask, what's going on with the winning culture? Isolated to Mikel Arteta, he's done a lot of good, but has he squeezed every blood from every stone? Has he utilised every resource? Has his unpopular decisions always worked? Has he been shooting himself in the foot tactically? And is it anyone's fault but Arteta and the players as to why in the last two years in particular, fair enough, the first year, I'll cut you a blight, we didn't win a league title and we've shot ourselves in the foot already. I personally genuinely feel those above Mikel Arteta didn't expect Arsenal to be in these conversations when it started. No, they didn't. It's dead, they man. Didn't. That first year, I think that really started like the deterioration of like what we were seeing. Because that first year, when we finished, we finished fifth, and then we turned around and led the league for damn near the whole thing. Two hundred plus. And that days. was not in the that was not in the roadmap. That happened too right. soon. But the fact that it happened to it happened too soon is the problem is we weren't prepared to compete at a high level because we were we'll going to capitalize on it. Walk. Yeah, we should first of all, that season that we finished 5th, we should have easily finished in the top 4. There was no reason why we shouldn't have finished in the top 4 and we didn't and we crumbled. Next season we crumble in the title race. You know, it's ever since then we've been kind of like teetering down. And it's this slow methodical way of the way that they want to build the club and and get back to winning ways. And I think it's too slow. For a club that hasn't won anything in a long time, you know, I think they should try to expedite it. And that's why they're, you know, any club that has had Enkedia and Jesus and Kai Havertz as strikers should be dying to buy a striker. And they went another summer window and didn't do it. That to me, that just says we want to slow things down. We want to go at our pace. We're not quite ready to, right. you know, we want to be a consistent top four team first before we start challenging but now we're we're right there and the one person that i've never heard really talk about uh titles and actually trophies is actually Mikel arteta because if you actually listen to the way that he speaks about winning it's about doing the best that we can improving every day i've never heard him once say we need, we're gonna win trophies i can't lie never, i have that's why i'm into him I can't lie, I, I have. That's why I'm on. I him. haven't. He, he does all of that. Like the last day of the season, him and Odegaard, even Josh Kroenke, if you look at when, and we'll get on to Eddie, when Eddie yeah, left, yeah. He, you look at that last paragraph, Kroenke, the, Josh Kroenke saying like, we want to win and, and, and win trophies and all of this. So what are, what's going on? Now, I think every fan, if we saw the things we wanted to see and we're not going to where we want to, what can you say? There's ambition. But as you touched on it, you know, you've given him a new deal collectively not just our tech our, the summer is not a summer of yeah we're gonna fight see even if we got the isacs the yokerez everything everyone wanted we still might be in this mess but at least there's ambition you can't yeah. come out and sign raheem sterling and say we didn't plan to do it you can't mess around scrambling on a deadline day for a goalie fair enough big up califuri i'm not against that or Mikel moreno but some people could criticize not only the speed but the need for those two profiles in which i think it's harsh but i think it i think it's very valid why do you think we're always the nearly men though like we we always there's a lot of four players i keep saying and not enough penetration why are we always the nearly men why do we always kiss mm. success and not necessarily get there mm, i feel like kind of like with real madrid how no matter what they win even when it seems very unlikely i think there is a little bit of like um a, a kind of like a magic thing you know and i think we have the opposite i think this club since they've been in the emirates you know, the Emirates era, it's cursed. I feel like has always been a story of nearly. So this isn't just an Arteta thing. This is a club thing for, and like I said, what it becomes a habit, winning is a habit, losing is a habit. And I think the instant pressure of this, this team is not just winning a title. It's winning the first title in 20 something years. I feel like that's much bigger than you know, what the Liverpool team under our, um, Arna slot is dealing with. They're not, it hasn't been 20 years since they won a trophy, right? So I think it's a little bit of that. But I also just think that we lack the things that most teams have that actually win major trophies. Is it cojones? Yeah, it's it's uh, the audacity, the types of personalities that you build your team around. It's, you know, players right. that show up in those moments. And that doesn't, that doesn't always manifest in a striker. Sometimes it's a winger. You know, sometimes it's different protagonists it's across the field. Midfielder. Gabriel is listening. Zinni used to do that for City in their own yeah. ways. And so now we're we're in this. We have a really nice team with a lot of nice guys that do a lot of nice shit. 
but you need the odd like bad guy. You need that. You need that player. And as much as he he, I think he pisses me off mostly because some of the stuff that he says is true, but it's a hard truth to take. Is Emmanuel Petit? You know, he's always throwing jabs, and I'm just like, shut the fuck up. But he was like. Arsenal don't have the balls to sign somebody like Paul Pogba. Now, I'm not advocating for us to sign Paul Pogba, um, but he's right. We would never sign the type of player we that... like the nice guy thing too much. And nice yeah. guys finish last, man. There's a bunch and of young lads out there that if I had a daughter, you wouldn't mind them, you know, being in a relationship with them. But you look at any team or any athlete, I'm not saying they're horrible to everyone, there's a collective sense of, like you're saying, nastiness. Like, and that's what yeah. I, I I think you're bang on the money. I, I think we're missing at least that. two, if not three of them. Type I think of you players. need more, Jeff. I'll be real. I think you need a whole yeah. squad of it in their own way. Yeah. The only players that I think. I know you're going to say. Have, I think the players that have shown me, like, that they have a little bit of that, you know, and have the ability to be, a, like, elite at that level are probably our defenders. I feel like they're the only ones that I look at and I'm like, yeah. You'll you'll go somewhere and and get a at, go to the Etihad and get a zero zero, you know. You did your job, you know. Clean sheet after clean sheet after clean sheet. You guys have showed me that you have that in you. In fact, our back line could probably look at our attackers last season and say, "You lost the lead, not us. You lost." That's true. I, I would say it's on. I think it's on everyone, including Arteta. Man, speaking of that. Do you think the injuries we've suffered in midfield are a reason for our lack of creativity, much less Odegaard being out? Or do you think it merely highlights a lot of what Mikel Arteta has been doing? As you know, we spoke about it on your channel. There's been a lot of talk about Mikel Arteta being a bit pragmatic, overly pragmatic, which is, I don't want to say it's very un Arsenal like, because those older than us can remember mm -hmm. the George Graham days. But for people in and around our age group, you look at the Vengas and things like that, where we played with a swagger. And as I said on your platform, personally, I think whatever you say about all of our attackers, I'm not saying we shouldn't have issues, but this shouldn't be a problem for Arsenal, if I'm honest with you. Yeah, I think um, it's not just about injuries. I think in general, we play in a way that doesn't promote consistent, fluid, creative football. I think Facts. it's very much like prescriptive. And, you know, at the beginning of last season, it was pretty much all set pieces. You know, we did a lot of set pieces papering over the cracks. Then we scored a lot of goals in a very short period of time. And to and me, Kibio was in the team. And Kibio was in the team. That's not who we are. Like, I feel like who we've been under Mikel Arteta for the most part is a lot of people like complaining or questioning the attacking football since he's been there. He's had one full season of consistent fluid football. And then but like we terrible in the second half of a lot of those games in the first yeah. year for the league. And I remember leads away. Piece. Yeah. And a piece of last season, but his first yeah. season, the second season, the se you know, there's always been periods where we're like, where is the attack? And so I think it's, <clears throat> you know, he's had Lacazette, he's had a bombing, he's had different types of strikers. And I think he struggles to coach like effective attacking football um, most of the time. Um, and I don't know if that's because he's trying to be pragmatic. I just think he's a, he's risk adverse by nature, you know, and he went one season of not being as risk adverse and he's damaged from that. And then, so he's just like fully been like, okay, no. Um, but I don't think you can play good attacking football without taking risks. And if you spend this amount of money on the goalkeepers, yeah, and you have the likes of Saliba and Gabriel, you have to back them to do their job every once in a while. We should not be having 11 men behind the ball against the Southamptons and Leicesters when they're in possession. Fuck them. Leave your guys high. Why are you doing that? Take a you know, risk, so, yeah. Fair enough. And you still, you still uh, conceding goals. You st the way you play, you still conceding goals. So Bang on the money. You know, yeah, and you buy a Declan Rice who is supposed to be somebody that helps you become more attacking because you can throw more men forward because now you have a triangle of Declan Rice and Saliba and Gabrielle and you lock us down even further. So I think even and though you're pressing like, from the front or defending, yeah, have a defense first approach. I don't think losing Odegaard means that how we looked this season makes any fucking sense. That's what I'll say. I don't think that those players are so bad that we shouldn't be able to conjure up a chance because a lot of teams don't have Odegaard. 
they don't have a player of that status in their team. Or Sakura or Martin, really. Yeah, but they got the they got odd little creative players out there. That Look at have, Bournemouth. Respectfully yeah. to Bournemouth. Look at their players. Like yeah. they put their playing ball. Forest yeah. even are in a bit of good form in that regards as well. Exactly. So yeah, I'm 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 thinking it's more of a Mikel thing. You know, and as time goes on, I'm starting to believe more and more. Well, I talk about this in group chat all the time, is that he got lucky with the 2022-2023 season and can't replicate it. Because how can you not replicate something? That I was think you're bang on the money, man. I think yeah. you're bang on the money. Do you, Are you confident about any signings in January? No. <laughs> Come on. I thought you'd be a bit more optimistic. I, that's why I asked. I thought, I thought you might be. No, I don't know, well, but I thought I'll someone has to be. I'll tell you what, I, like what I'm optimistic about, or what I'm excited about. The most excited thing I'm like, the most excited I am about anything around Arsenal right now is the sporting director conversation. To me, that's all that matters to me. That's all I'm caring about. When they, when I see something about sporting director, I'm like, cool. Because if Mikel, what have you made role, of the names we've been linked with as well? Because since you mentioned it, well, who are you bringing you know, in? Yeah, I think the names are great. You know, but we've been linked to good names in the past and ended up with internal signings and shit like that. And so until I see it, you know, I won't, you know, I won't go overboard. But I'm liking the names because they all have the same thing in common where limited resources, Lewis Compost, people be like, he's at PSG. Hold Bring on. Him. He was you at Monaco and Leon first. <laughs> like, exactly. Relax. Bring him but, very own two very own players that you know in with Nicholas Pepe and Gabriel he helped yeah. find him and Rafael a lot of people want him as well bring bring him for that's my first choice if I'm yeah, honest with you. I, I think this is such a good opportunity for Arsenal to go get the best person in the field in this Will one we? thing I don't think we do that enough Luis Campos to me is the best he has the most experience the most you know he has receipts. Yes, the PSG has been a shit show at times. But that's a but, political game at PSG. Yeah, but PSG is a shit there. show on a normal basis. Yeah, yeah. They're know, not all singing from the same hymn sheet. They've tried to do you a bit of everything there. Yeah, but this is Edu leaving. The first time that I heard the, the link, which was a couple of months ago before he actually left, my initial gut feeling was, I kind of hope he takes it. Just because it forces Arsenal to go get someone else. Because they're not going to change the manager. So if you can't change the manager and get a different coach and get a different coach and tactics, you can improve your recruitment and at least bring in better talent. And this is a good opportunity for us. The names are are good. Even the ones below Luis Campos are good. The only way that Arsenal can F it up is if they go out there and they go get, you know, say per murder soccer, you're the guy for the job. You know, forget, or, I don't want to see him on real Rizitsky or what some fans yeah, are suggesting. Or absorb experience guy. position altogether and give Arteta more power. That would be suicide. We don't need that. Um, so, yeah, I think that's all I'm really excited about because one thing going into this next summer window, because we ain't doing nothing in January, y'all. And, and to be honest, until a sporting director comes in, I don't want nothing. I don't want anything. No, I want until the sporting director is in, I don't really want to do anything. I, I want to sort out the contracts, if I'm honest with you. Yeah, apart from we that, with you. The, the contracts, but you don't need a sporting director to do that because you got Tim Lewis and Garlic in them. They can do that, you know. But and like nobody's gonna say no to giving Saliba and Saka a shit ton of money, you know. Well. <laughs> yeah. So I tried to yeah, sneak in David there. <laughs> That's what I'm. Ex that's what I'm excited about is the sporting director. You've been um, touching on it with the sporting director, yeah. Like you indirect. I can't remember exactly word for word what you said, but you mentioned Mikel Arteta's power and things like that. Now, rightly or wrongly, some of these decisions have worked. Kind of what we're both in agreement on in that the Cronkies are rather fond of Arteta. Now we know on paper Edu is probably above Mikel Arteta in the structure. Reality is the opposite. Whether they've worked or not, he wanted Partey. He wanted Calafuri. He wanted mm. Raya when at times it didn't seem clear, fair enough. He wanted Kai Havertz. Edu actually didn't want to get rid of Aubameyang. He did. Do you think if you get the Lewis Campos or all of these names, which if we went through it, they've all done good things. Do you think they're kind of damned if they do, damned if they don't? Because I'll be honest, like, I do think Edu made a lot of F-ups. I do think he, he, he weren't the guy like that. But I also have this feeling, and I've said it on your platform before, I think to a degree his voice is clouded out, rightly or wrongly. I think his yeah. voice is, crowd, is crowded out. So like, do you think that man who comes in needs to 
be able, obviously he's got to be able to puff out his chest, but do you think it has to be promoted in that? Because Arteta yeah. is left to his own devices, surely. I feel I feel like you're you're spot on. I think two things can be true at the same time that Edu didn't help himself and made mistakes on his own. Um but he even also, tried to do the get an academy in Brazil as well, and apparently I saw today and they said forget it. Yeah, and they told him no. So he didn't have a loud voice in the room. And the reports that are coming out, whether you believe them or not, are not something that you can look at and say that doesn't sound like it could happen that Anaki Kanya and Mikel Arteta are running recruitment. And that's why we're constantly, I mean, I do spend almost the entire summer window in Spain trying to get that backup goalkeeper instead of getting us a striker, instead of doing other stuff, you know? So um, that needs to be sorted out. You know, as much as they don't want Kia Jaraption in the club, which I don't because Edu and his agent connections is Kia Jaraption, it's also a damaging influence for Anaki Kanya because he's been making mistakes as well. So, <laughs> yeah. So we need a scouting or a scouting network and also a recruitment team and somebody heading that up that can tell Mikel no, because some of his ideas are great, you know, that he was recruited or saw Calafiori and knew that he was, that's, that's fine. But somebody has to tell you no for Kai Havertz. And the reason for that is not because Kai Havertz has not played well for us. It's not that Kai Havertz is a bad guy. I will defend Kai Havertz. Like, I, I think he's played good for us. But he didn't solve any of the problems that we had. The Indirectly, he's, he's made more through no fault of his own. Yeah. Even if he's kind of forward. 100%. And so I think having somebody like Luis Campos, he could say no to Mikel. But do the are the Cronkies going to enable whoever comes in to have that power? They have to. They have to restructure and reshuffle things where Arteta has a say. But like Klopp, when he says he wants to bring in Anthony, he's told no. Or Julian and Klopp Brown. wants someone and they don't not gonna get and they give him money. That's that's it. You know, because a lot of times coaches they have good ideas and they got bad ideas. Facts. They have bad ideas, you know, so it's not that Arteta's talent idea is awful. I think Arteta wanted Tomiyasu instead of Emerson, and he was right about that. You know, the injuries aside. Thank the right Lord for that, that, actually. Yeah, but he's, well, the, I think the further you get up the pitch, though, Mikel's ideas are less exciting, and that's the problem. Let's talk okay. about that. Like, yeah. How do, how do you feel about the striker thing? Obviously, we want a striker that gets goals. Like We know the game's changed and whatnot, but we want a striker that gets goals. But we all know that playing up front for Mikel Arteta is a selfless act. You know, If anything, you've got more freedoms on the flanks. You've got to drop deep, work the channels, don't really get chances provided to you. Like, Do you think we'll ever sign a striker? Because for me, I look at it like I look at Pep Guardiola in that We've seen him win the. We've seen him win leagues with a striker, no strikers, false nine, whatever have you. But when Haaland and I don't know another Haaland, but when Haaland became available, Pep surely had to sit there and say, you know what? There are some minimum requirements I need you to do on a pitch for me. But you're a goal scorer, and I don't want to say Haaland's the difference between winning a league or not because they've done it without him. But they won a treble with Haaland. Do you think Mikel Arteta has to sacrifice his principles? Because you you mentioned it. You know, you've got you've had Gabriel Jesus, Kai Havertz, Eddie and Ketia. They've not, not all necessarily been good enough, but they've not been terrible. But none of them are bagsmen. So I argue is, is it like if he was prolific, well, better yet, is being a prolific the main thing for a strike with Arteta? So it's like, how do you look at that? It's like, not. Been in with Isaac. It's not. Arteta's very much so like set in his system and the way that he wants to play, which in some ways, especially when he was building at the beginning was good. But now he needs to be able to like grow from that. He needs to be able to play in different ways and be adaptable. And I think in some ways he is, in some ways he's really not. And when it comes to like his attack, he really suffers from not being able to maneuver and change things up. Very rigid. Um, yeah, very rigid. And so Arsenal need a number nine. And here's one of my things about our recruitment process is if we can't get the perfect player, we get no one or we get, we get a stopgap. 
And fans and, believe that crap as well, which again, I understand not going for a player. If you know, because you know yourself, we used to sign players just for the sake of it. Then we took a different model, which I don't necessarily disagree with not signing players. But then the club kind of shoot themselves in the foot when you get Raheem Sterling. And I think fans fall for this crap of we need it. Of course, we need special players and this mythical stuff. But I always say, fair enough, I get that. And I'd more understand it if we was Real Madrid or City. At least you could say, oh, but yeah. we ain't done that. We're not, we well, ain't them. Well, that's what I feel like most teams in our position have multiple options in when they're recruiting. They have that's four or five names. And as you go down, they're probably less of what you want, but you're willing to take any of them. You know, we have one option. And if we don't get it, we don't get anything but a Sterling. And I'm when you look tried. at the striker options on the market, they're all very different. Um, Jokeris and, and Isak are nothing alike. Sesco is not like them. You know, Ali Watkins is different if he was on the market. So it cannot be another summer of if we can't get Isak, which is a suicide mission. The idea that we're going to get Alexander Isak with the off the field drama that we have against Newcastle, we're on one side, they're on the other. That cannot be undermined. Like that's not. Money for that. Yeah. And then they bought him for 70 million. This is a hundred million pound signing. And then you look at Jokerez as well. I don't know where we're at for that. You know, his yeah. manager's gone to United. I don't know yeah. where we go with that. He strikes me more as a Chelsea or a Man United signing. So you can't just not sign anybody though. You have to sign someone. And this is where the, I'm, I'm sorry, the sporting director has got to put his foot down and bring somebody in. But in terms of like Arteta needing a facilitator to be his center forward, that's all good and well and fine. If you have real goal scorers in midfield and on your wings, and you don't, and we only so, got Saka, really, yeah. that's getting those numbers. Really, the yeah, others have shown it on time, but Saka's the only one that you bet your life with. Yeah, Pep would never have a creative list team that only relies on KDB. And if if there is no KDB, there's no creativity. That's how Arteta has built his side so around Odegaard. Like you said. Yeah. He would never, Pep would never have a team that has a facilitator as his false nine where he doesn't have goals throughout the team and other places. He would never have a system that doesn't enable those players to get into good positions to do what they do best. That right. is the difference between Pep and Arteta. They have similar principles, but Pep never leaves his team creatorless, goalless, balanceless. He do you think that's an experience thing then? I think it's an experience thing, but I also think it's a, I'm learning. I'm learning on the job and I can't not look like I know what I'm doing. I think Arteta has, you know, done the Fair thing enough. where it's like, I'm, I have to act like I'm the guy in order for people to respect me. So changing things up is almost like an ad admitting that I'm getting it wrong. And I think that's what his, the slowness to make changes sometimes is. It's like, I don't want to undermine my, my thoughts or my, how I want to do things. That's why Kai Havertz is, in center forward right now he wasn't good at left center mid which was arteta's galaxy brain and he kind of got lucky that jesus is not playing well and then he's you know so yeah and i think that's where arteta's like thing is is he's been elevated if he got to learn his trade at sociedad i think he would be more open to like change and making those mistakes you look at pep and jabby alonso they both managed that that, that kind of academy level yeah. i do wonder where i'll take be if he had that i think you make a good point there yeah but i think when you're at arsenal and you started off your career with a lot of older like older players that were looking at you like bruh i had a better career than you or you're younger than me you know or we're the same age i think you have to go with a heavy hand whether you know maybe you sit in the you know the dark of your living room and say yeah, that wasn't right, you know, but you can't admit that. Yeah, yeah, you, you got know? you can't you have to puff out your chest. And I think yeah, there's a correlation. Yeah. I think you're right. I think there's a correlation, if I'm honest with I'm not gonna say there's no strong personalities in that dressing room, but you haven't really got the strong personalities per se. You've got the younger kind of players, players that are down on their luck, players that are more likely to buy into what you want to do, which is quite is quite mad. What do you feel of the Kudus links as we're with transfers? Because we've gone over your career, we've gone over is that yeah. we've been linked with Kudus. You buy it at all? It's another suicide mission. Eighty-five million release clause. We ain't got the we ain't got the minerals for that. Let's be so real. But I think we're him and Rafina now and Nico Williams again. But I was saying that you know I was saying this yesterday on a stream. I'm like, listen, we need to stop buying from the Prem all the time because you have to spend like 
Kudus, as good as he is, he has not increased his value by like 40 million in like a season. I don't think, you know, I think that's just Premier League tax. And so you're looking at the ESACs, you're looking at Kudus, that's all outside of what you can do. A good scouting network, network and a good sporting director gets you the next kudos, and you don't have to think about Even it anymore. John Duran, who I always banter you about the MLS, but he was scouted in the MLS, so <laughs> exactly. exception to the rule, man. Yeah, so I think that's you know some of these players that we're linked to. It doesn't just have to be these players. You know, they're not the one and only that can do what they do. Um, right. And so we can look outside and and find other things. Like I'm not that stressed out about not getting those players. So many of our players have come from the Premier League, so many of them. And the players that we've gotten from outside of the Premier League, they've been very hit or miss. And I think maybe that scared the club. But if you have somebody that you trust that's done it before. Do you think the foreign the, ones, I think you're right, but do you think the foreign ones currently in the squad have probably been more hit than the Prem? Well, Zinni, Jesus, they, they hit at a point. Havertz is hit in isolation to what he can do. Odegaard's been a hit on the other side. Part has been a, a hit to a degree, obviously not being fit. Same with Tommy yeah, Askew. Yeah. Fair enough. Raya's from the Premier League. Ramsdale was Premier League. Timber didn't come from the Premier League. Benjamin White, off the back of one season, was Premier League. Gabriel wasn't. Saliba wasn't. Yeah, where do you like? Which one do you think like? Is it the foreign recruits or the Prem ones? Just because you you, well, you sparked something in my brain there. I think the initial burn was having to deal with getting rid of Pepe when this new regime first came in. I think that was the initial rubbish, yeah. 72 million on somebody that didn't ever really like adapt to the league. That started like the initial like, mm. then we tried to do some low stakes ones like Sambi, you know, and like Tavares. Them two didn't work. So it was like, oh, you know, then you do um, Fabio Vieira. That didn't work. And so, yeah, the ones that are in the club right now and the team right now have worked out. You know, but they're also from like specific places as well. You know, I think we trust Ajax. Well, as I, we I should. Think, yeah, we trust Ajax. We trust Bologna. And we trust fucking Sociedad. You know, and that's where yeah. the players have came from. Back, <laughs> no? back, back on the money, man. You mentioned yeah. Sociedad there, yeah. Obviously, uh, to round up a couple quick fire topics I want to mm -hmm. go over, yeah. Mikel Moreno. Now, I don't know about you, but I said in the summer, I think he's a level raiser. Not, he's a floor raiser, not necessarily a level raiser. I feel there's been too much going both sides. There was, he's going to change our fortunes, his best thing since sliced bread. I think he was misprofiled. People looking at him to be a Xhaka replacement where he's almost like a, not a, a Spanish Declan Rice, but a Spanish Declan Rice. He's a, I'm not boying him, but a water carrier. As you know, he's been injured. He needs to adapt. I think he's only been poor when the whole team's been poor. I think he looked good against Chelsea. But I feel because of that height, people have kind of written him off already. Like, what do you make of him? I'm not worried about Mikel Marino because I yeah, feel like right. I'm very kind of um, in the midway with him where when we started off the, the transfer window, I said, you know, we needed a marquee, another marquee signing for the left center mid. You, you know, and we didn't get that. And so Marino doesn't solve that issue, but he solves the issue of balance. And you can get balance with a less talented player. So I'm not True. saying he lacks talent, but is he the upper echelon? No, he's not the top level that you could get. So I think I'm not worried about him. The cameo um, against uh, Chelsea, his performance against Liverpool, those are fine. You know, those were good. And he'll get better from there, especially when One he starts. One of our better players against teammate. Newcastle. Yeah, I thought, like, Marino is fine. 28 years old, he's good. You know, I'm not really worried about him at all, to be honest. So, yeah, I'm relaxed about it. I'm, actually, the signing's underwhelming. But in the case of Calafiore and Marino, both of those players, I feel like I know what they're going to do for us. So I'm not really worried about them if that makes sense i think you're bang on the money what, what do you what do you make of the injury to benjamin white like we've spoken oh, about it on your channel go and check that out people like we, we all know we've got a lot of injuries ben white's out allegedly for the rest of the year trossard's got a knock as well but what do you make of whites because he was someone in the summer oh my god he's not going to play football this that and the other he's now we now have to rely on calafuri timber and probably tommy asu and Partey. who fair enough party has been fit but it's quite techy where injuries are concerned. We've got a lot yeah. of games to come as well. So, yeah, man, where you at with that? I've seen people say, like, he couldn't have possibly 
got and got that um that surgery in the summer because you know timber was just coming back from acl and calafiori fitness and i'm just like yeah but it would have been better to miss two months of the summer and come now, in, in october than now miss the rest of the year so i do think he should have got because i thought he was going to get it i was like and ben white is going to get the surgery and ben white's gonna get the surgery and he never did it and now he needs to get it i'm so sorry but if you watch ben white play you always know when he's in the middle of an injury crisis because he don't play well. Because well, he, he plays play within well. himself, and he's one of our most consistent players. But he's been played into the ground for four years, and now it's like, you know, I hope he gets that agility and physicality and the the athleticism back because that's one of the things I really liked about him when he first came in. If you watch old videos of him at Leeds, at Brighton, and beginning at Arsenal, and the player that we're watching now is not the same player. I just think because he's always carrying something. So I uh, wish him the best with his surgery and I hope everything goes well and he, you know, mends and all that kind of stuff. But it leaves us in a position where we're always like a scratch away from maybe seeing less ideal options at the back. Yeah. We're, we're um, very close to that. Very yeah, close to that. So, and you got two players in Califiori and Timber where it's like the injury lottery. You just never know who's going to be out for the next game. Both of Tell them got problems. Well. Tamiyasu, Zinchenko. Oh, history of it. Yeah, and Zinchenko's not that, you know. Zinni as well. Yeah. So it's, for me, it's just one of those things. Now, should we be able to still survive? Absolutely. Even if you get down to Zinchenko and Thomas Partey as your fullbacks, I still expect us to be winning games. I still expect us to be winning games. I'm so. with you. And we need to win games with Forrest coming up. Yeah. Like, it I'm looks dark already. It could though. be darkness if we don't win. Yeah. I'm not going to be here and no, but you know, Califiori is such a key cog to the wheel. That Imagine. guy has been here for two seconds. He ain't no key exactly. to no cogs. Like, he's nothing. Right it's got nothing now. to do with winning games, man. Just win the games, yeah, man. There's people win. with less, man. Get This is why yeah. you have a squad. Arteta said we've got one of the smallest squads in February. I don't think much has changed. On that as well, like, I've got two questions to ask if I let you get out of here. Well, a bit of a three questions in two should we have sold emil smith row like you know my boy is doing what my boy should be doing and you could argue with martinelli's form even though he's turned a corner he could have done with smith row on the left boy boy some people sold their stocks boy oh I'm, car, you know? i think that was still a really good sale it was but we miss yeah. it yeah to me it's it's a really good sale still like doing well first of all doing well at fulham that's not the same as doing well at Arsenal. Let's be it so is. real. They took four points and, off us last year. I'm shameless. <laughs> but we also don't play. Like, if you watch the way that Fulham play, I still think it's a good sale because Arteta was... He, even when you wouldn't have played, seen the Smith Row banner. He wouldn't have seen he it. He wouldn't have played. Yeah, so I think he's doing really well. And we'll see um, if, like, a better team than Fulham comes and picks him up in the next couple of years. That's still something that could happen, you know, if he maintains, like, the levels that he's playing now. But I still think it's a good sale based on just Arteta and the way that he operates in midfield. No, the left center mid position since Jack has been gone, it's always been an odd fit for anyone who's played there. Fabio. No one showed Fabio. that they can long-term lock it down. Yeah. Even Miguel and, Moreno, if I'm honest with you, based on the last yeah. two years. Like, we've yeah, got a whole... And once, um, once Arteta said, because I remember there was one press conference where he said Emil's best position isn't left wing and I was like oh shit you know because that's where he played best for us I think is that left wing he made his name yeah and I'm like okay so if he takes that away from him what are his his chances of playing in left center mid because we know that that's like a weird piece of the puzzle that doesn't really suit his skill set so I'm happy for him he's balling out you know but they tried to make you, they tried to make me doubt him I told them, cream always rises to the top, man. Certain people rate Smith Rowe, some people rate Kivio, oh, man. It's different. It's different. It's no. different. No. Listen, I'll you play. have Jesus on your books, <laughs> and that's holding you down <laughs> badly. You I got like, I've got all but one stock in Gabriel <laughs> Jesus, man. Like yeah. we're not getting out the hood, man. Martinelli, if you can give me five goals this season, I know I'm bleeding. I'm all right. Gabriel Jesus, I'm I'm giving up, man. My last thing for you, yeah. Like, what do you make of the Forest game, and what do you make of Sterling at this moment? Yeah, I think the Forest game is just a good opportunity at home to reset and start looking more like ourselves. There's no excuse not to, um, because we'll hopefully, if no everybody came out unscathed except for Trossard, we should be able to play close to, if not our best 11. And so 
I'm Hope expecting so. fluid football. I'm expecting guys to be energetic. I'm expecting, you know, a win, a dub. You know, I'd love a clean sheet. Um, Sterling, I think maybe even I've unfairly lumped him with Jesus. I think the situations hey. are different. Um, but he needs, you know, when he get, comes out there, I want to see him look like the Sterling we know he is. Even at the age that he's at right now and the bad season at Chelsea, I still expect him to be a quality player. We see plenty of players in their 30s playing well in the Prem. So I know he's not Salah, but Mo Salah, Kevin De Bruyne. Not age. You're doing all right. It's not, it's not nothing he's to do with age. Yeah, it's about confidence and I think consistency. And so we'll see, you know, how that goes. But if we're up, because I expect Martinelli to start, if we are up a couple of goals, he's scoring. He, he's got to score. Don't no. celebrate his goals. Martinelli? He didn't believe in him. He's Who? begging. Martinelli's begging. Remember, you heard it. He's scoring against Forrest. Goals typically coming too. My boy is back. I All the Jesus that. stocks are going into Nelly now. I can't. I, I can't lose. You lot won the. You and Guna Lee, cool. You won the Gabriel Jesus thing. Smith Rowe is one one. That was such an thing. obvious one. I couldn't believe that you were actually like. Oh, you, why would you sell him? I was like, really. Like He's Brazilian, bro. Why would you listen? One's Brazilian. Smith Rowe came from the academy. The logic is gone. Like, yo, I'm with you to the end. Yeah. I can't forget the trenches, man. But it's easy to say that. But my issue is like not even letting Smith Rowe go or Fabio go. It's just, and you said it on the on your stream. Go and check that out, people. It's like we didn't replace them or upgrade on them. It's like we were kind of in the same position in terms of depth. Give or take, we look stronger at, in in defense, but that's being tested. So. It's like we do five good things, five bad things. We go forward 10 steps. We go back 10 steps. So we're still in the same place. But hopefully against Forest, we get our title challenge or what's left of it back on board, man. Just let them know where they can find you. I can't imagine they don't know. But it is customary. Yeah. Uh, See how nice you're treated on my platform versus <laughs> yours. Oh, my goodness. Um we do not mistreat you over on the She Knows People, Arsenal. go and watch the next... Go and watch her stream. Like, uh, mistreatment. It was the nicest you've been to me, but mistreatment. Um, You guys could just put in the search bar on YouTube, She Knows Arsenal or Jessica Black, and I'll pop up, and you'll see, you know, the content. Did a stream with Deluded. Go watch how nice I was to him. So, yeah. She's capping. But on that note, people, I'm sure you lot agree and disagree with a lot of what we've said. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. And on that note, make sure you're following Jess's platform. Go and check out the video we did on her platform because we actually covered indirectly a lot of what we spoke here. But again, very different. We spoke about Nottingham Forest and we spoke about a lot of other factors. So, yeah, man, hopefully the next time we do this, we've finally got a win. But yeah, on that note, people, peace.